In this video, we'll be discussing postpartum hemorrhage, or PPH. In other words, it's when a patient loses a lot of blood after delivery. Now, PPH is an important obstetric emergency and is a common cause of death in patients as well. If you know what it is, what causes it, and how you can manage it, then you can help play a role in preventing death in these patients. Now, there's two types of PPH, primary and secondary. Primary PPH is simply when a patient loses at least 500 ml of blood or more within 24 hours of delivery. On the other hand, secondary PPH is when a patient loses at least 500 ml of blood or more, but between 24 hours and 12 weeks after delivery. Let's discuss minor and major PPH. Minor PPH means that there's been blood loss between 500 ml and 1000 ml or 1 liter. Major PPH is when there's blood loss more than 1000 ml or 1 liter. Now, in the real world, it's common to see loss of blood that's, it, that's between 500 ml and 1000 ml, and many women can actually tolerate that. Now, keep in mind, not all women can tolerate such blood loss. And if the woman is showing maternal signs of tachycardia, basically when your resting heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute, ultimately a heart rate that's too fast, or perhaps the woman is showing symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, or a feeling of faintness, then PPH should be really considered and thought about. Now, low blood pressure is also an important symptom to watch out for because what it means is that a lot of blood loss has occurred, which then causes a drop in blood pressure, and this shows up pretty late. Now, women that are young and fit can withstand actually large amounts of blood loss without really showing any clinical symptoms because they're young and fit. Tachycardia generally is the earliest symptom that will show up in these patients. So there's three different groups of risk factors or things that are more likely to result in PPH for the mother. And I'll be discussing these three groups in the next part of this video. And the first group that I want to talk about is something called pre-existing maternal risk factors. And what that really means is that the mother herself has these things due to her past history or she currently has these things. And because of these things, she's more likely to have postpartum hemorrhage. So I came up with a mnemonic to help you better remember the pre-existing maternal risk factors for PPH, and it stands for Group B app as an application. So the G stands for grand multiparity, or any woman who has given birth to five children or more. Raised maternal age, obviously, if the woman is older and less fit, then she's more likely to have PPH. If she's obese, or O, or if she's really overweight, then that, that can also cause PPH. If she has uterine fibroids, or if she's primiparis, meaning that she has given birth to only one child or she's pregnant for the first time. Also, B stands for bleeding disorders. So if she has von Willebrand disease or any platelet disorder, that can cause PPH as well. And if she had antepartum hemorrhage in her pregnancy, uh, that can also you know, give a much more increased chance for PPH. And any previous histories of C-sections or PPH itself will obviously increase the likelihood of her having PPH in the current pregnancy as well. So the second group is called intrapartum maternal risk factors or things that can happen to the mother during the birth process that can cause PPH. And the mnemonic for this, if you need it, is called C-pipe because these things you generally see with your eyes during the birth process. And since giving birth is kind of like a baby coming through a pipe, so that's one way you can remember that. Uh, so what is the mnemonic? So C stands for cesarean sections. So if the woman is having a C-section, then that can also cause PPH. If she's having prolonged labor, uh, or a birth process that's taking too much time, that can give rise to PPH as well. If she has instrumental delivery, or if she has pyrexia in labor, which means fever during birth process, or if she gets an episiotomy, which is basically a surgical incision or cut that's made with sterile scissors, and that's done to expand the vaginal opening to kind of prevent the tearing when the baby is coming through in the last stages of labor. The third and last group is called fetal risk factors for PPH. So these are things relevant to the fetus or the baby that can cause PPH. And the first one is large baby. So a big baby is more likely to cause PPH because of its increased size. Uh, if there's multiple pregnancy, so for example, having twins or triplets and so forth, this can increase the chance of PPH because of how many babies and how much size are taking up. Uh, polyhydramnios, which basically mean, means that there's an excess of amniotic fluid in the amniotic sac, poly meaning much many and hydramnios meaning a lot of amniotic fluid. And lastly, shoulder dystocia. And basically, this is when, during the birth process, the baby's head gets delivered, but the anterior shoulder of the baby gets stuck above the pubic, the mother's pubic bone. And then this can cause PPH. So now I'm going to talk about the causes of PPH. And a good way to remember them is something called the four T's. 
and we're going to start with tone, the first T. And in tone, you have something called uterine etne. And uterine etne is the failure of the uterus to contract after the placenta is delivered. Now, this itself can cause a huge amount of blood loss right after delivery. So it's important to stay alert and watch out for it. Apart from that, the second T is tissue. And in this case, we have retained placenta and or membranes. So basically, part of the placenta is still inside the woman. And then this can cause PPH. The third T is something called trauma. So if the vagina is injured, or if there's perennial or uterine tears at a, at a C-section, then this physical trauma can cause a lot of bleeding as well, especially PPH. And the last one is thrombin. So any clotting disorders, or for example, maybe the woman has von Willebrand disease, then this can also give rise to PPH. So the first thing we're going to discuss as far as the management goes is the initial steps that we would take if there is a PPH case on our hands. So the first thing you're going to do is send for help. Why? Because PPH is an emergency and it requires the help of multiple people. So what you want to do is you want to get help from a senior obstetrician, a senior midwife, the anesthetist, and a porter. Because this is an emergency and you need help with multiple people and multiple disciplines to make sure that the patient is managed properly. On top of that, we're going to establish two 14-gauge intravenous lines and we're going to start an oxygen mask on the patient immediately. One way you can remember these initial steps is uh, H2O or water. And the H stands for help, two stands for the fact that we need to establish two 14 gauge IV lines, and O for oxygen. So H2O is a great way to remember the initial steps for PPH management. The next steps include putting a Foley's catheter into the bladder, and this is done due to the fact that an empty urinary bladder can help promote contractions of the uterus, which is something that we really want in this situation. We're going to set up a fluid balance chart as well to monitor the inflow of fluids. We're going to assess the renal function tests and the liver function tests. And we're going to start immediate fluid resuscitation via the pre-established IV lines that I mentioned just a minute ago. Of course, apart from that, we're going to do a full blood count and clotting studies to assess the blood profile of the patient. And we're going to arrange for a cross match of at least six units of blood when we need them. And of course, we're going to alert the blood bank because the blood bank people in the hospital, for example, are the ones that are in charge of managing all the blood. And of course, we have to consult the hematology department. Why? Because, for example, if the patient comes in with some severe PPH or a lot of blood loss, then there will be certain issues in the patient's blood profile that have to be corrected. And in this case, we would arrange for fresh frozen plasma, platelets, and things like cryoprecipitate in case it's needed. Of course, we're going to manage the central venous pressure and maintain arterial lines as well, and we have to transfuse the blood ASAP. We're also going to do a vaginal examination, which is done to expel any clots if there are any. We're also going to check and assess the genital tract to see if it has any trauma or tears. And one of the first line things that people can do is a uterine massage. And this is done because it encourages contraction of the uterus. Apart from that, we're also simultaneously going to give a bolus of a drug, which is used to manage the third stage of labor. So, for example, oxytocin or centrometrin. And we're going to give an infusion of oxytocin, typically 40 international units over 500 ml in four hours. And we can also do bimanual compression as well and use more potent drugs if it's necessary, such as ergometrine, prostaglandin, F2-alpha, and misoprostol. If the bleeding persists, we have to transfer the patient to the OT. And in this case, we would do a more thorough examination under general anesthesia because the patient's unconscious. And we would take more drastic measures, such as uh, doing a uterine tamponade using uterine balloons. We could do a radiological occlusion of the uterine arteries or vessels. We can do a laparotomy to ligate the bilateral iliac arteries, which are a major source of blood supply. We can do uterine compression sutures. And at the very last resort, if things aren't going well, we can do a hysterectomy, which is a end-stage procedure. 